Hi, I'm your host, Kelly Jo, and this is the Nourished Motherhood Podcast, a show dedicated to bringing together the voices of motherhood and helping women connect with others and themselves through the power of sharing honest, vulnerable stories. Because every woman deserves to have a place where her voice is heard. We believe that supporting mothers is one of the healthiest things we can do for our society. There's a balance of beauty and grit to be found in every woman's story. And we're so honored you're here to listen, connect, and grow with us. Let's dive in. About one in three women give birth via cesarean section in the United States. In the birth space, we naturally talk a lot about vaginal births and what to expect during labor and delivery, but most of us don't hear much about what to expect while giving birth during a C-section. While I haven't personally had a high-risk pregnancy, nor have I given birth via cesarean, I have friends who have, and while some of them didn't mind and were happy with their birth, others felt disempowered and wished they had known more about what to expect ahead of time. I'm a firm believer that when we are educated and given the facts, we can better advocate for ourselves and care for our mental and emotional well-being. So with so little information out there for women in this area, I wanted to learn more about the ins and outs of high-risk pregnancies and what it's like to have a C-section. And I was able to connect with Dr. Tanya Hall, an OBGYN at Alaska Women's Health, and get a glimpse of what it's like for mamas giving birth via cesarean section in the OR. What she shares is so insightful and gives a really great overview of what a mom can expect while giving birth in the OR. And regardless of what kind of birth you're planning, what she shares is empowering for women and their partners. Dr. Hall has a huge heart and loves walking with women through pregnancies and beyond. Friends of mine have said they don't know what they would have done without her by their side in both their losses and in the birth of their beautiful babes. In addition to serving women in the health and birth space, Tanya loves family, work, and play. In her free time, you can find her scrambling up peaks after her crazy sons, hobby homesteading, foraging, berry picking, fishing, hunting, and enjoying her husband's amazing cooking and homebrew. I truly enjoyed my time and conversation with Dr. Hall, and I know you will too. Hello, Dr. Hall. I am so excited to welcome you into our Nourished Motherhood community, and I'm really excited about the conversation we're going to have today. Uh, Dr. Hall is a board-certified OBGYN. She practices at the Alaska Women's Health Center. Is it center or clinic? Just Alaska Women's Women's Health. Health, Originally, it was Alaska Women's Health Service, but then they sort of dropped the service, so now it's just Alaska Women's Health. Awesome. Yes, and that's at Providence, Alaska's Medical Center, right? Yes, but we do deliveries um, at Providence and Alaska Regional. So mm-hmm. we're, we're housed in, in, under the roof of Providence, but we're a private practice there. Awesome. So cool. So yeah, we have Dr. Hall with us. She's going to share. We're going to specifically dive into high-risk pregnancies, what to be aware of, C-sections, kind of the ins and outs of that, and just motherhood in general. So I'm just so excited to have you here, and I would love to hear from you. What does life look like? right now for you and your family? Where in the world are you? And well, you're in Alaska, but what does that look mean for you? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I want to say tail end of summer, but it's rapidly starting to feel like fall and we just finished, um, dip net fishing and we've limited in two days, which was really great. My, my kids' bodies, my kids are, I have two boys, they're five and seven. Their bodies are almost entirely made out of salmon, salmon and noodles basically. So we have to have a, a freezer full of salmon for the winter. So we did that. And then last week we got back from caribou hunting we just made 29 jars of red currant jelly and I made one jar of black currant jelly. I found like a little patch, but it wasn't big enough for more than a jar. We picked 30 pounds of raspberries last weekend and we're kind of, we froze them. I, I, it's like too much for now. Um, we got a bunch of blueberries while we were, um, caribou hunting as well. And then I did a little bit of fireweed jelly this year. Last year I did a huge batch. This year I just did a tiny batch. So we're kind of doing the the hunter gatherer, trying to fill up the stores for winter, which I think is what a lot of Alaskan families are doing right now too. Yes, I love it. Do you have like a favorite recipe with like you use for your berries? I use the UAF. um, I don't know if, I don't know the exact name of it, but whatever berry I'm using, I just Google red currant UAF. University of Alaska Fairbanks. And they have a really cool, it's a PDF file that's free to download for 
rose hips, fireweed, red currants, raspberries, blueberries, anything. And it has some really cool nutritional facts about the berry. It has a bunch of, it's like how to, how to preserve it, um, how to extract the juice, and then a bunch of different recipes, whether you want to do jelly or syrup or candies or whatever. So I, I'm a graduate of UAF, and um, and so I'm kind of a groupie for them anyway, but I use their site for everything. Like last year, I did rose hip stuff for the first time, and I'd never used rose hips before, and so I used the PDF from there and got inspired, and it's actually one of my favorite things to to preserve right now. Really? I tried rose hips once and it's hard. It's a lot of processing. I'm impressed. It, yeah, it kind of is, but, uh, well, I haven't harvested them yet this season because they're not ready yet. But last year, um, we did it for the first time and it was really fun and, and cool. delicious. So yeah, that's so awesome. And you're originally from Alaska too, correct? Yes. Born and raised. Yes. That's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's great. I would love to hear more about your journey into medicine, specifically obstetrics and gynecology. Like how did that even come about for you? Well, I, I went into medicine originally thinking I wanted to be a family doctor. And um, my grandpa back in the forties and fifties was the family practice doc in Seward. And really like a lot of the Kenai Peninsula. And he was the old school, like, you know, delivered babies, took out appendixes, like he kind of did everything. And I found that really kind of romantic and inspiring. And I thought that's what I wanted to do. So that's what that idea that like, you know, idea up in the sky is what originally attracted me to medicine. Um, and if you would have asked me, you know, day one of medical school, what I wanted to be and what I didn't want to be, I would say, well, I think I'm going to do family practice. I'm definitely not going to do OBGYN. And <laughs> OBGYN kind of has a bad rap in some um, medical circles because there's long hours. You don't always get to sleep when normal people are sleeping. You know, there's a bad reputation for you get sued all the time and malpractice insurance is really high. And I, of course, had heard all of these things. And so it was like, well, I want to be a family doctor, but I don't think I'm going to do the deliver babies part. And so that's kind of what launched me into medical school. And the first two years of most medical schools are mostly classroom based. And so you're learning a lot of the rapid fire content. And I pretty much loved everything, but I really loved um, endocrinology and reproduction, embryology. And then when I started doing my clinical years, my very first rotation was pediatrics. And I loved children, but I really did not love pediatrics. And um, a big part of family practice is, of course, like, you know, caring for the whole family. And um, and so I, I felt a little lost after that experience, you know, like, well, what am I going to do now? And then I had internal medicine, which is mostly caring for adults and sick adults. And I actually really enjoyed that. I liked having a problem and I could fix it. And then the patient could carry on with their life and a problem and I could fix it and they could carry on with their life. And so I guess specifically inpatient medicine, I really liked. And I, I'm someone who, um, I pass out when I get my blood drawn, like, uh, and I, I, I used to try to donate blood and I became such a liability that they were like, you know, your blood types A positive and that's the most common and, and it's dangerous enough for you to be here that like, we'll call you if we get real desperate, but you don't need to keep trying to donate blood. So I thought that wow. surgery wow. and OB were going to be just, I was going to be passing out all over the place and really embarrassed. So I actually scheduled them at the very end of my, like the last possible times I could do those rotations. Um, but then turns out I don't pass out when I see other people's blood. It's just my own. <laughs> and so I had surgery first. And I was really drawn to surgery and I, I wouldn't have expected that, but it kind of had that resonating theme again, where there's you know, a problem and I can fix it and the patient can go on with their life and a problem and I fix it and they go on. But I didn't really jive with personalities of general surgeons so much. Like they're not the people mm -hmm. I'd want to go and hang out with after work. No offense. There's, they're wonderful people, but you can kind of get a sense of like, these are my peeps and maybe not my peeps. And so then actually my last, um, rotation of my my third year of medical school when you kind of are supposed to figure out what you want to do when you grow up was OB um, and I worked with a wonderful gentleman here in Anchorage um, Dr. Owen Bell and oh, you know the hours wonder, are, he's like the twin whisperer right like yes yes, yes. well and I'm trying to be his apprentice but yes he's a twin, <laughs> twin whisperer um, oh, and so it. I worked with 
I worked with Dr. Bell and, you know, the hours are long and a lot of babies like to show up in the middle of the night. And I was just so excited every day to wake up at like my first birth. I like bawled my eyes out, you know, it's just this incredible thing to get to participate in. Um, and, and even the features of what you're doing in clinic, I really got into all of that, you know, like contraception, preventative medicine for women, empowering women to be comfortable with their bodies. And so, you know, here I was at the tail end of medical school and I'd sort of developed a plan to go into internal medicine and I thought I was going to be a hospital doctor. And then at the very last minute was like, shoot, I think I need to make a change. And I'm so glad that I did. I actually ended up doing kind of a last minute rotation at the native hospital in Anchorage on labor and delivery there to decide, you know, is this, do I really want to put all my eggs in this other basket? And it was such an incredible month. I got to work with the midwives a lot there and they, they just do incredible things. Um, and I saw wild stuff that even in my four years of residency in Maine, and then even in practice now, I don't know that I've quite replicated all of the interesting things I saw that month um, at the Native Medical Center, but it really solidified for me that that's, you know, women's health is where I wanted to be. And that's how I wanted to dedicate my, my learning and my career. That's amazing. I, I actually was, I was doing pre-med previously before I went into like more preventative wellness and nutrition, but I, I shadowed some of the OBs over at native and I, same thing. I was so inspired by yeah. the team over there and just the, the midwives, OBs. And I, what were some of the things you learned in that time that were just, that's been so transformational for you? So some of the things that were really interesting, especially compared to the way that I practice now is there's women from all over the state that have a wide range of resources or not. Um, there are a lot of women who, it's not that they didn't seek prenatal care, it's just they have more of a, um, a birth knowledge that's passed on through generations. Mm -hmm. And so, and learning some of like the, the cultural aspects about, you know, birth in different cultures, whether it's Alaska Native or we have a really big Hmong population, Pacific Islander population. Um, it's just really interesting the the different threads that are woven into this fabric of you know birth depending on where someone's from. And so there's a lot of just completely healthy people having babies, which is wonderful to see. But then it's amazing how quickly a completely healthy situation can turn sideways, especially if someone hasn't had more, you know, standard prenatal care. And so I, I just got to see a lot of that, you know, in, on my early education side of things, but then also, you know, that just continues all through residency and now in my practice um, in Anchorage now. Wow, that's amazing. Do you spend, you know, have you, would you say you spend more of your time with high risk pregnancies uh, or is it kind of all over the board for you? It's kind of all over the board. I definitely have a special interest in high risk pregnancy. So I think that those things kind of will gravitate, you know, your, the things that you're trying to attract will be attracted to you, I yes. guess. But I'd say I probably do about 50-50 um, GYN. So like well woman care, contraception, those things, um, GYN surgeries, and then 50% um, obstetrics. And it's probably a 50-50 split there um, between high risk and low risk. Okay, cool. So. Yeah, I, my friends who have worked with you, they've been more in the high risk category and they're like, she is the superstar of high risk pregnancies oh. and just like everything we needed on our labor team and like that I didn't know. So um, yeah, it, I mean, it sounds just from their experiences that it is a passion of yours. Like that comes out for sure. Well, I would love to dive into, I think a lot of us go into pregnancy, not even thinking really about high risk. Maybe we get handed a pamphlet about some things that could arise or things to like when to call your provider, but can we talk a little bit more about some really common like situations or things that come up symptoms that cause, like make you a candidate for high-risk pregnancies, like what to be looking out for and just kind of dive more into that. Yeah. So the way that I kind of think about high-risk pregnancies conceptually, or I guess pregnancy in general is, you know, the ultimate goal at the end of the road is a healthy mom and a healthy baby or babies, if there's more than one. And high risk happens when there is one or multiple barriers to achieving that goal, potential barriers. And then 
prenatal care becomes a dance to try to optimize you know, the best outcomes for both mom and baby if you do have some barrier. And sometimes the barrier is the placenta, like a common thing in a healthy woman with the placenta is if it covers the cervix, well, you are now not a candidate for a vaginal delivery and you get to have a C-section. And most of the time things go fine, but um, bleeding is much higher risk with a previa and needing a transfusion and medicines to help with all of that. And so um, that's not usually something that a woman wouldn't know about until the last minute um, because ultrasounds are so common now, we often find out a lot of those details pretty early around you know, 19 or 20 weeks and sometimes even earlier than that. The main thing to look out for there is um, vaginal bleeding and not necessarily first trimester bleeding because that's very common and most of the time will not be of any consequence. But red vaginal bleeding at any time later in pregnancy needs to be checked on and you know at least a conversation with your doctor about you know are are there certain things that may or may not be going on. Along with that, it, you know, if you know that you don't have a placenta previa and you're having bleeding, um, another problem with the placenta, placental abruption, is where there's kind of tearing or bruising in the space between the placenta and the uterus. And that can be very dangerous for the mom and the baby. And so that's always something that we keep in mind. Um, it's not real common to have that happen out of nowhere or have it happen spontaneously, although I have seen that. It tends to happen more commonly with injuries. So mm. car accidents, which in Alaska in the winter, like, you know, icy road fender benders. And it's incredible how little force it actually takes to cause some of that tearing, especially in the third trimester. Same. So we really, we really encourage any patients who, you know, have slip and fall on the ice and hit your belly, or, you know, I had a lady who was bathing with her small child and she slipped in the shower, but landed on her belly on the side, side wall of the, um, the tub, you know, it's not like a bad thing will happen, but it kind of, it needs to be evaluated because if a uh, abruption does occur, it can sometimes progress really quickly. And that can definitely threaten the life of both mom and baby. So any belly trauma or, you know, any real fall or injury in general, it doesn't mean that there's going to be a red flag, but it is something that should at least trigger a conversation with your doctor soon. Like don't wait till the morning, but like, as soon as it happens, um, you know, just check in and make sure that additional monitoring isn't um, recommended. And then along the lines, I, well, maybe I'll stop there. I've said a couple of things about placentas. It is such a huge big list of, um, you know, what can promote someone into a high risk situation. Um, and sometimes it comes up with, there's a lot of different screening tests that are available these days for chromosome problems like Down syndrome, um, carrier conditions like cystic fibrosis. There's a common test that we get around 15 weeks that screens for spina bifida. Um, or sometimes we'll see things on the anatomy ultrasound that aren't expected, whether it's a, you know, something going on with the baby, the placenta, sometimes the shape of the uterus. Women can have really big fibroids during pregnancy, which is like a, a growth in the muscle of the uterus, which is benign, but sometimes they can cause issues. And then later in pregnancy, um, sometimes women develop diabetes or high blood pressure. Sometimes women actually have those before they get pregnant, and that automatically puts someone into a high-risk category um, if they have those conditions before pregnancy. It doesn't mean anything bad will happen, but we do have much closer monitoring and lab tests and checking on baby that we do for women who are in those categories. And most of the time we know about that on the on onset, but sometimes otherwise healthy women might show up and not know that they had diabetes until they have a sugar right. test in early pregnancy. And then it's like, oh, well, there's this extra piece that we have to work with now. And then twins, of course, oftentimes things go fine, but when there's you know double the babies, it can be double the drama and double the fun. Um, and so we do monitor those pregnancies more carefully too. So what does that look like, especially for like any first time moms listening or, um, you know, someone maybe was recently just diagnosed with something that's either them or with baby, uh, what does that look like for that extra monitoring? Could you just kind of walk us through what a normal pregnancy looks like? Just if you're healthy, everything's low risk, and then what it would look like if you are high risk, how that kind of changes things in your care. Yeah. Yeah. And every practice will probably have slight variations on a theme, whether you're seeing, you know, a midwife or a doctor or whatever practitioner you're seeing. In our practice, what we typically do for 
well, really most pregnancies is um, you have your first visit somewhere between eight to 10 weeks, assuming that you're doing fine. If you're throwing up like crazy and losing weight, you know, having bleeding, anything, we'll see people sooner, but assuming things are going fine, we have that first visit between eight to 10 weeks. We usually spend about an hour with the patient going over a whole boatload of information, you know, exercise in pregnancy, healthy eating in pregnancy, um, all of the different uh, testing options that are available, they're all optional. We do some basic lab work to check a person's blood type, screen for rare infections that most people don't have, like hepatitis, HIV, things like that. But if you didn't know that you had that, it can be passed to a baby. And so we screen pretty much everybody for that unless they decline. And then initially in the, in the first and second trimester, if things are going according to a normal plan. Um, we see women about once a month. And then um, we do have a patient portal where patients can send non-urgent questions. So like, hey, I'm kind of constipated. You know, what can I do for that? Well, sometimes that can be urgent, but we have a 24-hour line where people can get in touch with a triage nurse or an on-call provider at any moment if they need anything. Um, but the patient portal is really great because there's a lot of questions that come up like, oh my gosh, my prenatal doesn't have DHA in it. Like, should I change my prenatal? You know, just things like that that kind mm -hmm. of come up. We usually do screening for diabetes on everybody between 25 and 28 weeks. And that's with a sugar test. We also check for anemia at that same time. Um, after 28 weeks, we see everyone two weeks on a two week basis until 36 weeks. And then each week until the baby arrives. Um, and that's most pregnancies, including some high risk, but if you are high risk, depending on the reason that has put you in that category, often those visits may be more frequent, you know, especially if someone has diabetes, we're monitoring sugars sometimes weekly, um, or if someone has high blood pressure, we're keeping a really close eye on their high blood pressure. And so not all high risk patients, but many of them will end up doing something that's called antenatal testing. And that's really just keeping an extra close eye on the baby. And the baby ends up being kind of a surrogate for the placenta because often what we're worried about, of course, is the baby, but it's, is the placenta working as well as it's supposed to? And so um, what antenatal testing is, is usually one, but often two things. One is called a non-stress test. And if you've ever seen anybody in labor or been in labor, you know, they put those two straps on your belly and one of them looks at the baby's heart rate and the mm -hmm. other one looks for contractions. And so it's just a 20 minute version of that. And if the baby looks great, it just takes 20 minutes and then you get the blessing and you get to leave. And often that's twice a week. So divided like Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, we even do them on weekends, Wednesday, Saturday to accommodate, you know, working moms or people with busy schedules. Um, and then often once a week, we'll do a biophysical profile, which is a shorter ultrasound that looks for four things that are signs of a, a happy baby. Um, it's practice breathing, which is flexing their little diaphragm muscle, um, making sure the fluid level around the baby looks healthy. We like to see the neck and spine kind of flexing and moving and then arms and legs flexing and extending. And if you see those four things, odds are that you've got a baby who's fabulous. If you don't see those things, it doesn't mean that the baby has a problem, but we may need to monitor things more carefully at that point. We usually don't start testing earlier than 32 weeks for most conditions, although some do warrant closer monitoring. If the baby is much smaller than expected, um, or there's a pregnancy condition called cholestasis where it's, it's kind of a liver issue, but it can result in stillbirth. Um, so there's some conditions where we'll, we'll start monitoring things very early. Rarely is it sooner than 28 weeks, um, but most high-risk conditions, we don't start monitoring more carefully until 32 weeks, so about eight months. Wow. Yeah, that's, I think that's really helpful just for women to hear who've never been through, you know, like through a pregnancy, they don't know what to expect. And, you know, sometimes things just happen and they don't, you know, there's some stuff out of our control. There's definitely things in our control, but often there's out of it. Um, before we started recording, you had mentioned how fast sometimes things can turn, um, especially in those later stages of pregnancy that can lead mm -hmm. to unplanned cesareans. Can you talk more about some of those things? Yeah. So the things that tend to come up quickly, you know, there's a whole number of things, but, you know, something like placental abruption, that's usually a more of an acute event. 
Um, sometimes when moms develop high blood pressure or a condition called preeclampsia in pregnancy, those changes can happen really quickly. Often if people end up with an unscheduled or unplanned C-section, probably the most common cause is because the baby's heart rate in labor is not what we call reassuring. Um, and sometimes if it's really dangerous, you know, if the baby's heart rate drops and we try a whole bunch of different things to get it to recover, if it doesn't recover, obviously a C-section is the fastest way to get a baby delivered if you're really worried about their safety. But emergency c-sections happen less than one percent of the time um so a lot of people are kind of it's a it's a anxiety people have and i totally understand why but it is an uncommon event you know c-sections themselves are relatively common but emergency you know got to get the baby out as fast as we can c-sections are not common so i don't know if that is kind of answering your question or if you have any uh, yeah no that's great what are, what are some things in the later stage of pregnancy women should be aware of just symptoms to be like, when should they call a provider? Yeah, really. I think women are good at knowing their bodies. And if you feel like something is not right, it doesn't mean that it's not right, but it is worth paying attention to that and talking to your provider about what you're feeling. Because I do, I mean, I can't count the number of times that I've had a patient come in and just say like, I don't, I can't exactly tell you what's wrong, but something does not feel right to me. Um, and I always listen to that because I really think women know, know their bodies best. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things we do in later pregnancies, uh, uh, you know, in third trimester and beyond, other than just, you know, check in with people and make sure that they're doing okay is checking blood pressure. If women do begin to develop high blood pressure in pregnancy, the real alarming symptoms to watch out for are a bad headache that doesn't go away. So, you know, if it's, if you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't sleep last night. I didn't have my caffeine this morning. I took some Tylenol and a nap and a coffee and I feel better. That's not a preeclampsia headache, okay. but it often starts kind of behind your eyes, kind of in the frontal forehead. And it's a, it can start as a dull ache, but it can progress to a really bad headache that you just can't get to go away. Not every headache is preeclampsia, but a bad headache that doesn't go away should be evaluated. Changes in the vision, especially spots or sparkles kind of on the periphery or the outside of the vision or like blurry vision that doesn't get better if you're not someone who like needs a new prescription on your glasses. Um, and again, kind of like the headache, it's not like if you're in a hot shower too long and you get a little dizzy and, you know, spots in your vision, that's not preeclampsia. But it's more if you're going about your regular day and you just feel like, man, I'm having to like squint and, you know, there's just something going on with my eyes that's not normal. Um, that can be a sign of dangerously high blood pressure. Pain in the upper belly, especially kind of in the middle or on the right hand side tucked under the ribs. You know, sometimes that's bad heartburn, but it can be a sign of high blood pressure, preeclampsia or liver things, gallbladder things, which pregnant women are more prone to anyway. So, if, and, and not like I, you know, the baby kicked me and it hurts right there, but, you know, kind of like a, a, an aching, gnawing feeling that is just not going away, or certainly if it's getting worse, you know, nausea, vomiting that came out of nowhere, if you don't think you got a gut bug from your preschooler, you know, um, anything like that. If people have concerns, we always want to at least have a conversation about it and decide if it does need any additional workup. That's really helpful. I, I love the kind of going further into the descriptions of those symptoms too, because I think it can be easy to maybe get too nervous. Right. But also, so knowing what's kind of normal, but what's, what's clearly not normal. And I think that can be so helpful talking about, yeah, unplanned C-sections, emergency C-sections. Can we kind of dive into some of those things? Because I think a lot of women end up in that situation and it's not part of their plan. It's not part of how they envisioned birth and for some, they're okay with it and others, it's a really traumatic event for them and it's something they really have to process through. So can we talk through kind of going more into what that looks like? At what point would a, a woman be recommended to have a C-section? I know you briefly mentioned, but then kind of even the process of what she could expect um, if that situation arises. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great question. So if it's a expected c-section and there's a number of reasons why that might happen probably the most common these days is a breech baby um, and that just means that the baby's head isn't first i guess breech or any breech slash anything other than head first sometimes babies are sideways in there they can be kind of like oblique position and over time 
the risks of trying to deliver a baby vaginally whose breech has become much higher than the risks to the mom by having a C-section. So there are still a few providers, I'm trying to think if I can think of any offhand in Anchorage, maybe like one or two who will entertain delivering a breech baby vaginally, but you have to be a really perfect candidate for that. Um, the one exception is in twins, there are some providers who will deliver the first baby if they are head first vaginally. And then you can actually reach up, grab the second baby's feet and pull them out by the feet. That's called breech extraction. Wow. Um, with an epidural, of course, you're not gonna do that to someone who can feel everything. Um, so that's kind of like a side topic. So I'd say having a, a baby that's breech or not head down is probably one of the more common reasons. Often women find out about that around 36 or 37 weeks. And we don't do a C-section, a scheduled C-section, usually until around 39, maybe 40 weeks at the latest. And there are some things we can do to try and turn a breech baby. And so that's a conversation in itself. But that might be a reason that someone just ends up having a C-section where, you know, their first OB visit, they weren't really anticipating that. A placenta previa, like I mentioned, is mm -hmm. for sure you don't want to try and pass a baby through the placenta on their way out. It's pretty rare that we recommend a C-section for a baby that we think is too big to fit, but there are a few times when that might be a discussion that's had. If somebody is in labor and things are not progressing normally, you know, the baby's heart rate looks fine, but the labor progress for whatever reason is not marching along as it should. Um, or sometimes a, push, a woman has been pushing and pushing really strong, really well for hours and hours. And if you're not seeing progress, meaning the baby seems like they're moving in the right direction to coming out vaginally, um, those are sometimes reasons women will have a C-section because there might be a disconnect in the geometry of what's going on. You know, the shape of the mom's pelvic bones, the size or position of the baby's head, the size of the baby in general, uh, it just might not be working that way. So I'd say those are some of the times when I feel women are the most disappointed when they feel like you know, I was trying so hard and, you know, I ended up with a C-section and a C-section to me is not a failure. You know, no. like I said, at the very beginning, healthy mom, healthy baby, that is the goal. And so my, my favorite birth plan is a very flexible birth plan. Um, you know, and if healthy mommy, healthy baby is at the top of the list, then it's pretty hard. You know, you, sometimes it's hard to not be disappointed. But um, if those goals are achieved, that's really what everyone wants. I love that. What is the actual like process like? So a woman's been like, you know, suggested, okay, this is what we're going to do. Change of plans. What can she expect going from her laboring room into the OR? Just, I want to know the whole process kind of, can you just yeah. walk us through that? Yeah, totally. So we always go over a consent form where we go over the risks and benefits of surgery and alternatives of surgery. We make sure that, you know, mom and partner's questions are answered. And then if a woman's been in labor and they have an epidural already, then sometimes the anesthesia doctor can give kind of a booster dose of medicine in the epidural that can be used for a C-section. If it's not a woman who's in labor, um, you know, say for example, a breech baby and it's scheduled at 39 weeks, then typically they do a type of anesthesia called spinal. And it's similar to an epidural in terms of how they put it in, but it's just a dose of medicine that once it's in, the needle comes out and that's all that stays with the person. With an epidural, there's a little tiny plastic catheter that stays in the back so that the mom can continually get doses of medicine for the unpredictable duration of labor. Um, with a spinal, the strong numbing usually lasts about two hours, but with an epidural, you know, most women labor is not two hours. And so it's, it's there to last for, you know, the question mark amount of time. And so when a woman is having either an epidural or a spinal placed, they usually, they'll go over consent with anesthesia as well, but they sit and kind of tuck their chin and curl uh, on, on the table. The anesthesia doctor cleans off their back with some, str some strong soap. They do some numbing medicine close to the skin. And hopefully that's actually the worst part of the whole thing. Cause it can be kind of a pinchy, like bee stingy pinch feeling. Mm -hmm. And then they give that a second to kick in. Once that's working, they do numbing medicine in the deeper spot. And when that's in the right place, a woman's butt and feet start to get kind of warm and tingly. I had one woman describe it as, I feel like my butt is embarrassed, uh, which I thought was kind of a cute way to describe it. 
so um, cute. So when when the when the butt and feet start to feel warm and tingly, that means the medicine's in the right place. And then they have a, a lady rest back on the operating table. Um, often they'll put a little bump under one hip and it's typically the right hip. And that's just so the woman's not, the weight of the uterus isn't pressing on the big, big blood vessels that are trying to return blood to the mom's heart. They always check the baby's heart rate, make sure baby still sounds fine after the spinal medicine goes in. It can be really common to have blood pressure get lower after a spinal is placed for a lot of reasons, um, but it's just kind of how that medicine works. And if a woman's blood pressure drops suddenly, they can often get pretty nauseous, sometimes throw up. So they will often give women some extra fluids in their IV beforehand to try and kind of buffer that drop in blood pressure. And then there's also a lot of things that we try and do in general to help with nausea and vomiting because it's miserable no matter what, but especially if you're going to be like laying on your back. Then uh, there's circulation boots that we put on the woman's lower legs to help prevent blood clots in the legs until she's up walking around later. They put a catheter in the bladder once the numbing medicine is kicking in. So hopefully she won't be feeling that so much, but a woman can't feel when she has to pee for a number of hours, even after the spinal has worn off. And so you just don't want your bladder to get too full and you know, that, that would create its own issue. Um, so a catheter will go in the bladder and then we clean the skin with some strong soap. Usually that has to dry for three minutes. Every now and then they'll do two layers of the soap and sometimes, so sometimes three to six minutes for the drying time. Um, then there's a sterile drape that we put on, and then we give the mommy's tummy a big pinch to make sure that that spinal or epidural num numbing medicine is working really well. One of the things you had, uh, we had shared an email, there are different types of drapes that you can use to put on a mom. Hmm. Um, one that I really like to use, but in the era of COVID, you know, there's national shortages of everything. Um, and so the clear drape that I like to use hasn't been available for several months. Wow. Um, but I really like the clear drape because the portion that kind of comes up in front of the in like in front of the mom's face is a window basically. And then there's a little blue panel that you can't see through that's right in front of the mom. So most people don't want to see themselves being operated on. It's sort of a bizarre thing to be awake having surgery anyway. But while we're getting the baby delivered, you know, that blue panel is blocking the view. But then once the baby is actually born and we're doing delayed clamping of the umbilical cord, you can raise the little blue panel and babies, you know, right in front of your face. So you can see them there while you're doing the de delayed clamping. So we don't have that right now. So instead of that, we just kind of drop the drape down and remind mommy that, you know, baby right now is still sterile. Um, but as soon as we're done with the delayed cord clamping, um, you know, sometimes we'll do direct skin to skin with mom, or if baby is showing any signs of needing some extra help, um, then the baby, whether it's a doctor or nurses are right there to help baby if they need any extra attention, but that was kind of skipping ahead. So, um, once the drape is on the numbing medicine has been checked, then we do something called a timeout, which is everyone in the room gets quiet. We make sure that it's the right patient having the right procedure. We talk about any patient specific risks that there might be, like if we anticipate that there's a higher chance than average of having bleeding. Um, if the NICU is in the room, we make sure that they have all the information about the baby and any concerns that we have about the baby. Antibiotics are usually given beforehand. And if people have allergies, you know, we pick one thing. If people don't have allergies, we pick another thing. Um, and then getting the baby delivered usually takes about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on, and if, and if it's a mom's first C-section, it might be faster than that. If a mom has had C-sections before, sometimes it's about that long or maybe a little longer, just depending on how much scar tissue they have. When the baby's getting ready to be born, one thing I've had patients say that they really didn't expect is, and I thought before I did this job, like, oh, once you do a C-section, it's easy to get the baby out, but it's not always easy to get the baby out. And so, you know, you make an incision in the uterus and you're either grabbing the baby's feet or bottom if they're breech or their head, but then you kind of have to generate a contraction to get the rest of the baby to come out. It's not like they have a handle, although if you can grab their feet, it sort of is like a handle. And so usually the assistant, and often it's another doctor, but sometimes it's a midwife um, or the surgical tech will put pressure on the mom's upper belly, like where the fundus, mm -hmm. the top of the uterus is to generate the force to actually get the baby to come out of the little hole that you've made. And it can feel like you have an elephant sitting on you trying to get your baby out. And so I've had women say like, you know, it, it didn't hurt, but I was, I, I was not expecting to have it feel like somebody was sitting on me to get the baby out. Um, and so that, that part is usually a few seconds. And then all of a sudden there's a baby in the room and, you know, we drop the drape or lift up the little, um, blue window thing so that you can see baby. 
Um, if we're expecting a healthy, vigorous baby, which most of the time we are, then most practitioners these days are still doing delayed clamping of the umbilical cord, even at the time of C-section. And that can range for between 45 and 60 seconds. There's a balance because we, it is really healthy to get the baby some extra blood flow, but there's also now a hole in the uterus that is bleeding. And so if you wait too long, you know, you don't want the mom to be losing a lot of extra blood that might not result in better things for the baby. So we don't usually delay that for more than a minute. And sometimes we'll clamp it even faster if we're worried that the mom is bleeding too much, or if the baby isn't starting to kind of perk up and squawk and cry and do happy baby things. Um, I have had patients who really like to do um, skin to skin directly during C-section. And in that case, the, the baby catcher is aware of that because we, I still need to keep myself sterile. So I'll hand the baby over the top of the drape to the nurse or um, baby provider, and then they can put the baby directly on mom. Um, or dad, if, you know, sometimes when you're flat on your back, it's, it can feel a little awkward to have baby right on your chest like that. So mom or dad can do skin to skin. Um, if the baby isn't vigorous or if, you know, if the NICU has any concerns, then they might need to check on baby and do an assessment before they do skin to skin. And in that case, there's a little, a little warmer, a little bassinet thing where they can check on the baby right in the same room. And that's usually tried to put in the view of the mom. So even though you can't be right at the bedside, you can look over your shoulder and see the baby there. And if dad um, or partner wants to go over and be with baby, they can see everything that's going on. Once the baby's out, there's kind of a blissful distraction and you're not really like paying as much attention to everything else that's going on in the room. Um, but at that point, the placenta comes out. We clean, we do some irrigating to kind of get out any you know, if there's meconium or babies have that kind of baby cheese on them called vernix, you know, we try and clean all that out. So that's not staying in the mom's tummy. Um, so up the uterus and then basically put everything back together like we found it. And that part usually, again, is maybe 15 or 20 minutes. So most of the time, uh, a routine run of the mill C-section is somewhere between 40 minutes to an hour, maybe 30 minutes to an hour, just depending on how things are going. And then fairly common these days, depending on the institution where someone is, is something that's called a TAP block, T-A-P. It stands for transverse abdominis plane. And it's just a space in the abdomen where the nerves that travel to the incision run. And many anesthesia providers after the C-section will offer to do a TAP block. And it's just long acting numbing medicine that lasts for between 18 to 24 hours. Oh, and wow. they can use an ultrasound to guide that numbing medicine right to where those nerves are to help provide increased comfort and decrease the need to use strong pain medicines like narcotics that can make people feel kind of like loopy and constipated and nauseous. Um, it's not that people won't need those medicines at all, but it can really minimize the amount that they need, at least for that first 18 to 24 hours. So if someone would like to have that done, um, they often do that. You know, we're completely finished with the C-section. All the stitches are done. The bandage is on. Um, and then while the mom is still resting there on the table, it adds about five minutes. And then they go into the recovery area. And if mom and baby are both doing well, we get skin to skin going and breastfeeding and keeping an eye on mom's vital signs and bleeding and making sure that her urine is normal and all of those things. Typically a woman will be in the recovery area for one to two hours. And during that time, then the spinal or epidural num numbing medicine are slowly wearing off. And then for most people, the average stay in the hospital after a routine C-section is between two and four nights. And that totally depends on how mom and baby are doing. Um, most insurances will pay for up to four nights without any problem. Um, and if there's complications or anything like that, then longer is fine, but um, that's kind of the average. I've had a few patients go home one day after a C-section. Wow. I, I would say most of the time that's people who've had a C-section before and know what to expect, but that's uncommon. I'd say that's probably like 2% of patients. Um, most people, it's at least two to four nights. What's the um, like common recovery look like different from like a vaginal birth? Is it a longer process? I mean, that's major abdominal surgery. What are some tips for healing and what does that process look like? 
Yeah, the biggest differences I would say are obviously the discomfort that a woman's going to feel. And, you know, if you need a whole bunch of stitches in your perineum, you know, that doesn't always feel great either. And so it's really just where are your stitches located and how, you know, how much discomfort is that causing? The biggest difference in terms of activity restrictions um, is you can't soak the incision for two weeks. So you can shower even the same day, but no tub, hot tub, pool, ocean um, for at least two weeks after a C-section. And that's just to prevent infection in the wound. Not lifting anything heavier than you can easily pick up with one hand. So like baby in the car seat. So for most people that's around 10, maybe 15 pounds max. And that's for six weeks because you wanna let all of the sutures have a really good head start on healing before you really strain your belly muscles or your abdominal wall. And then those are really the two main things that are different between a vaginal and a C-section. We, we recommend after a vaginal delivery, nothing in the vagina for six weeks to prevent infection. Or if someone has stitches in the, in the nether regions, you want to let those yes. heal too. Um, and so that's the same with the C-section as well. And then really the only other thing I can think of is driving. Um, and so the rules about driving after a C-section, there's not really a hard and fast rule, but what I tell patients is you should be completely off narcotics. And you have to imagine if a a small kid or a moose goes in front of the car, you need to be able to slam on the brakes without hesitating from pain. And the darn seatbelt goes right where your incision is. And so I'd say the average for most women is probably about two weeks after is when they feel comfortable driving. Some women, it might be sooner than that, um, but that's kind of where the average seems to fall. Some women, it might be later than that, um, but th that's kind of the average. Yeah, that's really interesting. What are some of the things that a woman, you know, obviously the first goal, like you said, is healthy mom, healthy baby, but what are some of the like decisions I've heard? Like there can be music in the OR or like partners, sometimes a couple people, what can you tell us? Like maybe some stuff that could be planned out in a woman's birth plan, or she could think about just in case the unthinkable, you know, like things just go unplanned for right. her. Right. Yeah, most of the time, well, at least I'm sure every institution might have some differences, but in my institution, um, music in the OR, if it's not an emergency, is great. And so if a woman has kind of a motivational soundtrack that they want to have going, then that's perfect. Um, there is some ability to have lower lighting. You know, we do still have to be able to see what we're doing at the operating site. And so um, the surgical lights are on, but sometimes there can be lower lighting in the room if the other baby staff is okay with that. I would not say that people feel strongly about that most of the time. Um, it, if a clear drape is available, although like I said right now, I don't know when they're gonna become available again, but I really like them. I think they're pretty cool. The delayed cord clamping, which is fairly standard now, and I don't think I've ever met someone who said that they didn't want delayed cord clamping, but if that's something that a person, a uh, family feels strongly about. The quickness of doing skin to skin, um, if someone feels strongly about that and with it, whether it's with mom or partner, how quickly you want to start breastfeeding. And when I've had moms do skin to skin in the OR, if, if the baby starts rooting and mom feels like logistically she can get the baby to that area, you can even start breastfeeding right, right away. None of the medicines that are used make it so that you can't breastfeed right away. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else kind of like modifiable or optional from that side of things. Yeah, I think like, those are the main ones. You, you had asked a question in our um, emailing about vaginal seeding. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a conversation that I have with people. I would say it doesn't come up very often as a question. Um, and to me, it makes a lot of sense, but we just don't have the science to back up the safety yet. And the whole idea about vaginal seeding is that when babies are born vaginally, the baby gets exposed to the mom's normal healthy bacteria in the vagina. It goes on their skin. We're finding that it may actually end up coating, you know, the stomach, the bowel, the GI tract. And that initial bacteria that sets up shop can actually affect the vitamins that we get exposed to and the way that our body digests food and the way that our early immune system starts to develop. And so it's super important. We know that, but what we don't know is really the safety of this concept of vaginal seeding. Um, and what that is, is, is if uh, when, when I've done it a few times, um, the mom will take a little gauze pad, like a little, they're called four by four little gauze and put it in the vagina before the C-section. Um, and then if she chooses to do vaginal seeding, she or the partner, when they're in the recovery room with the baby, they can use that to swab the baby's nose, face, mouth. They're the 
governing body that I subscribe to, the American College of OBGYN, um, has a committee opinion on vaginal seeding that if I have this conversation with patients ahead of time, I'll go over with them um, because it basically says like, we understand why patients are interested in this, but we just don't have studies and scientific confidence to say that while there may be benefit, that there, there could also be unanticipated harms. Um, right. And one consideration with that is a common skin bacteria that we screen everybody for in pregnancy, usually around 36 weeks is called group B strep. About 30% of women just normally have that on their skin. It does not cause problems for moms, but if it gets on the baby, when a woman's in labor, when their water breaks, or if you were to do vaginal seeding, it's a, it used to be a common cause of meningitis, which is a, a can be a terrible infection um, in the baby's, the coating of the brain and um, spinal column that can be life-threatening and it can cause life-altering problems. Um, but since we started screening for it years ago and giving moms in labor antibiotics to cover that, the rates of group B meningitis in babies has really fallen. And so even in women who are having scheduled C-sections, I still routinely get a group B swab in case they go into labor before the scheduled time. Mm -hmm. um, or if a woman is considering vaginal seeding, I absolutely recommend getting that. And if it's positive, it's still a woman's choice what to do with her baby and her body, but I really, really strongly discourage it if the group B is positive. So I don't know if that kind of, I, that hadn't been a question that you had said yet, but it was a question that we, you know, shot back and forth in the email. Yes, no, that's great. Um, I mean, yeah, I think it's just so helpful to be able to get even just like a play by play of what to expect, because I feel like, you know, if a woman's watching this or listening to this and can know what to expect, chances are, right. You said like, it's, it's rare, right. To, to have, or it's less common, I would say to have a C-section, but to know what to anticipate or expect, should that happen, I think can be really helpful just for even peace of mind processing through it. And so I really, I've learned stuff too, just listening to all the different processes. I want to kind of talk about, you have said a couple different times in a couple different ways, you really trust mom's intuition, right? Like if, if she says something's off, she might not know why, or, you know, mom's body, mom's baby, or like your baby, your choice. And I like, I feel like there's such a, so many women have experienced not being heard or not being advocated for, or feeling disempowered in the medical system. And so I would love to hear what are some things that can really foster that connection? Because I can just, you know, tell that's such a heartbeat of yours that a woman would be empowered through this process. And can you talk about where you see disconnects and where that connection can be strengthened? Yeah, for sure. I think if you're looking for a provider who kind of has some of those qualities, word of mouth is really huge. You know, nothing speaks a greater compliment than if you have someone whose baby you delivered and they're like, oh my gosh, I would have 12 babies with that per provider. Um, so I think that can be really great if you're, if you're really looking for someone who has certain qualities, not all, oh, well, and it's not just doctors. You know, I feel like if you're going to become a midwife, you probably already have some of those innate qualities, but I've met some gruff midwives before too. Um, and so I think a person's personality is what it is. And I've met plenty of doctors who are kind of gushy and, you know, they want to just learn all about a person and help them accomplish their healthcare goals. And there's people who are a little more, I, not that there's anything wrong with being paternalistic, um, but just in the way that they practice medicine are a little bit more, this is the way I do things and take it or leave it. So I think Word of mouth recommendations can be really helpful, especially if someone's already traveled down a path with a provider, they can really attest to the experience that, the, that they've had. We do sometimes have patients leave town or move in the middle of a pregnancy with great trepidation. They're like, we love the care we're getting at your clinic. We were military. We don't have a choice in leaving, but like, wow, how am I going to find a provider that I trust in, you know, Houston, Texas, where I don't know anybody. Um, one thing I recommend for patients is you can usually find the phone number for labor and delivery online, call labor and delivery, say, Hey, I'm 32 weeks pregnant. I'm moving to town. 
you work with all these providers, who do you recommend? You know, the labor and delivery nurses see how everybody does things. Um, and I think they will give candid uh, responses about, you know, who to see or who to avoid. And so that can be a way if you don't have a friend or, you know, someone that you know to ask, like, you know, this is my first baby. I don't know who to go to. You know, sometimes people have insurance preferences, so they may not might not necessarily have the same level of choice if you can just kind of right. pick anyone that you want to go to. So I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but. No, I think that's so helpful. But, I would have never thought to call like the labor and delivery and just ask the nurse. I mean, I think that's really brilliant and helpful because yeah. so many, I mean, especially right now, I feel like there's so many transitions. A lot of people are moving, right? Just jobs have changed. There's a lot in the air for so many families. And so I think that's really just practical, helpful advice. That's yeah. great. What is something, you know, like kind of wrapping up our time, I have a couple more questions, but something I don't know enough to ask in this space that you would think that would be really important or you want women to know? Well, we've touched on a lot of really, I think, good topics and things that people might not think about on the front end. But I just think having a provider that you really trust is so important because then if the unexpected happens, you're not wondering about their agenda. And so I think doing a little bit of research on the front end before you you know, start building that relationship with someone can save a lot of heartache. Or if you begin that journey and you're having feelings like, oh, you know, this is not exactly the way that I saw my care unfolding, you know, feel empowered to make a change. You know, people transfer care all the time. Um, and there's really no, there should be no shame in that if you're, if you're not getting the care that you want to be getting. So, you know, I, I, I guess if it happens, I don't always find out, but if a, if a patient wasn't comfortable with the care they were getting with me and they sought care elsewhere, I want a woman to feel comfortable going through this journey because there can be a lot of uncertainties and questions that arise along the way. And if you don't have a really trusting relationship, it's uncomfortable for everyone, not just the patient. It's uncomfortable for me. If I feel like I'm taking care of someone that's not really, um, you know, investing in what I'm recommending it, that, that can be a hard place to be in. So I would just say, make sure that you're with a provider that you really jive with and that you really trust. And if that's not where you are, then find someone who does satisfy whatever needs aren't being met. Mm, that's really good. Uh, okay. So you have a five, five-year-old and a seven-year-old you said, right? So if yes. you could turn back time and go back to the beginning of motherhood, what would you tell yourself? And for, especially for that new mom out there, I would say you are going to feel like a failure a lot of the time. And you're not, <laughs> you know, there's just like, I wanted to be a mom. I, I can't remember ever not wanting to be a mom and it's just humbling. You know, it's so wonderful and so joyful, but there's so many times when I'm like, I just totally blew that. And when you're a working mom in particular, you know, there's times when I don't feel like I'm doing motherhood well. I don't feel like I'm being a good wife. I don't feel like I'm working the way or as hard as I should be because you have comp competing and they shouldn't be competing, but it can feel that way, you know, competing priorities. Yeah. Um, but I would just say, you got to give yourself a break. You're doing all of the things well, and you're not always going to feel like a champion, but you still are. And you just have to accept that you're not going to, you're not going to feel perfect probably most of the time, but you still are perfect. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I think having grace is so important because I mean, I'm still I feel like a new mom. I have a three and a half year old, but <laughs> it's like every day there's something new, right. And you get used to one stage and it changes and yeah. And balancing, right. As women who have a career, right. And have kids, it's, it's a lot to manage too. Oh, totally. Wow. Well, this has been such a special time and I'm just so grateful that you just took us down that path to just like talk about some stuff we don't normally talk about and give us some like insight um, and just even really practical tips. So thank you so much for this time. And again, you're at the Alaska Women's Health, right? Alaska Women's Health yes. at Providence. Yes. And Yes. I've just heard nothing but wonderful things. And I just, I would love to spend more time with you. This has been so great. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thank you so much and good luck. You know, no one stays pregnant forever. So you've got big plans sometime soon. <laughs> soon. I know it's like the deadline that will come, you know, <laughs> right. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And I will be in touch with you too. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Nourished Motherhood podcast. Have you connected with us on Instagram yet? If not, head over and follow us at nourished.motherhood. We share advice and tips for your fertility, pregnancy, and motherhood journey, as well as inspiration for happier, healthier living and snippets of behind-the-scenes life in Alaska. Come, let's be Insta friends.